Good afternoon. I'd like to call our meeting to order with a quick roll call. Regent Acker. Present. Regent Beam. Here. Regent Bernstein. Here. Regent Brown. Regent Hubbard. Here. Regent Illich. Here. Regent Weiser. Here. Regent White. Here. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this afternoon for our fi final meeting of 2023. We've had a great year together. To be sure, we've had challenges. We've also had a year of sustained growth and inspired achievement as an institution. To offer just one example, at our meeting in October, the board approved construction of the University of Michigan Center for Innovation in Detroit. And I remain so grateful for their approval and their confidence in our team. Next week, we will break ground on this new $250 million facility, which when complete will be a world-class research, education, and entrepreneurship center. One that will empower the next generation of Detroiters to dream bigger dreams and to make their dreams come into reality. We also recently hired Scott Shireman as the UMCI's inaugural director. He's an experienced higher education administrator with deep expertise in global and online education. I'm so delighted to welcome him to our team. And I look forward with eager expectation to see what he will achieve. And I think he'll achieve a great deal. I'm also pleased to announce that so many members of our community continue to grapple with the violence in the Middle East we are announcing a new institute to combat anti-Semitism and to advance religious inclusion. Our new University of Michigan Raoul Wallenberg Institute will be housed in the University of Michigan College of Literature, Science, and the Arts and be further developed with investments across the university. We look forward to sharing more details about the University of Michigan Wallenberg Institute in the days to come even as we continue our university-wide efforts to advance religious inclusion, education, research, and scholarship. Today, we are bringing together leading University of Michigan expertise and diverse perspectives towards a safer and more inclusive world, and even more, a brighter world of peace. On a different matter, at our September meeting, I promise to provide an update before the end of the semester on the proposed unarmed non-police emergency response initiative. We have benchmarked comparable programs at other higher educational institutions, gathered an inventory of existing University of Michigan services to support a collective crisis response, and identified a work group to address the best way forward. I am pleased with the actions to date and look forward to further progress in the new year. As I promised, I'll keep you apprised of that progress. To start the new year, we will be cheering on our Wolverines in their quest for a national championship. And I'd like to congratulate them again for not only winning a third consecutive Big Ten championship, but for showing incredible character in the face of adversity this season. I'm also proud that the University of Michigan continues to be a leader among higher education institutions for students studying abroad. From 2021 to 22, the most recent academic year with complete data, we had more than 2,000 students studying abroad, which placed us in the top 10 nationally. We are proudly an international school, and it is a vital part of our identity as a research university. Finally, I'd like to welcome another individual and possibly a family that after an extended absence has found a new home in our community. Last month, the staff members at our Mathai Botanical Gardens discovered that beavers were building a dam across what's called Fleming Creek. This is the first time beavers have been in the area since the gardens were established more than a century ago and we're happy to welcome them here to Ann Arbor and so delighted that they have joined our family. Thanks again for joining us today as we go to the rest of the business for this meeting. I'd like to also wish all of you here in person and also watching 
uh, by streaming video, a happy holiday season, one which we hope will be full of light and memories. I'd like to turn it over to Provost Macaulay, who will introduce our SACOA chair to give his annual report. Provost Macaulay. Thank you, President Ono. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Tom Braun, who will be joining us virtually. A professor of biostatistics, Tom currently serves as the SACUA and Senate Assembly Chair. In that role, Professor Braun and I work collaboratively on many issues of concern to faculty. Tom, please go ahead. Okay, I, will, I guess we'll... Since she's not uh, on, we will move on to the next agenda item, and if he does appear on Zoom, we'll revert back to him. Over to you, EVP Chattis, for our endowment report. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to extend my congratulations to Eric Lundberg and his team for another outstanding year in managing the endowments here at the University of Michigan. The long-term portfolio generated a 5.2% return for fiscal year 2023, just about keeping up with inflation. And to put this in perspective, that 5.2% return was amongst the highest of the 25 largest university endowments. Our long-term pool is diversified, and this diversified approach has helped us over long time periods with the long-term portfolio generating a 14.7% annualized return over the past three years and a 9.9% over the last 20, compared to a 7.6% at the median of university endowments. Excellent performance overall. And finally, the endowment has achieved these returns with less volatility than in public investments, which is important for maintaining stable growth, and the university has focused its energy transition investments on areas that offer a strong risk-adjusted return, as well as significant near-term positive environmental impact, including creating renewable energy and lowering greenhouse gas emissions through industrial processes and agriculture. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. We now move on to our committee reports, and our first committee is the Health Affairs Committee, headed by Regent Bernstein. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Ono. The Health Affairs Committee was... Uh, we met last earlier this week. Uh, the meeting included Regents Beam and Hubbard. Uh, we received updates on strategy, financials, U of M health, and emergency services. Thank you very much. The next committee report is the Finance, Audit, and Investment Committee, uh, Chair of the Board of Regents, uh, Regent Hubbard. Thanks, President Ono. The FAI committee, including Regent Weiser, met on November 17th for a financial update and a discussion on the long-term investment pool investment policy. Thank you very much. Back over to you, uh, Regent Hubbard, for the chair's report. Yeah, thank you so much. So I have a quick update on some regental activities since we last met. So on November 13th, Regent Bernstein and I took part in the Higher Learning Committee reaccreditation evaluation meeting on the U of M Dearborn campus with Chancellor, Chancellor Grasso and that team. And it was a very good discussion. Uh, I was honored to be part of the portrait unveiling for President Emerita Mary Sue Coleman the 13th president of the University of Michigan. This historic event was followed by President Ono's very first State of the University address on November 27th, which you can find online if you have some time. President Ono was the keynote speaker at the Detroit Economic Club on November 29th, and I joined him there um, and listened as he spoke to the challenges and the achievements over his first year uh, at U of M. And we all are very much looking forward to winter commencement festivities that are fast approaching and, of course, the Rose Bowl. So I'll see you in Pasadena. Go Blue. Go Blue. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. I think uh, uh, SACWA chair is not yet on. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll move on then to the public comment on an agenda item. E.P. Churchill. Thank you. We are now moving into the public comment section of the meeting, and there's another section at the end of the meeting. As part of the regular meeting, many of you know, the region set aside time for individuals to present comments to the board. The board does not necessarily respond to comments during the public comment session as they may require study and decision making. All public board meetings are formal events convened under Section 8, <clears throat> excuse me, Article 8, Section 4 of the Michigan Constitution. In keeping with reasonable and appropriate norms of decorum, all attendees, including speakers, are expected to treat others with respect and civility. And that includes individuals speaking not only at the table, but also in the audience who will be addressing the board. We want everyone to have a chance to be heard, 
by the board. Thank you. Individuals who are approved to speak will be expected to speak on the topic that was submitted during the registration period. Uh, truthfully disclose any relevant organizational ties during that submission and promptly spe seek speaking when the uh, allocated time ends. Speakers who do not adhere to these rules may be cut off during this meeting in, if they don't abide uh, by those rules and may be precluded from addressing the board in the future. This is in addition to other guidelines we have online. So those are the same rules that apply now to one speaker and then at the end of the meeting. With that, I will call our first speaker, Zachariah Farah. He's not here, okay. Then we will continue at the end of the meeting with our other speakers, thank you. Uh, I understand Tom Brown's not so long, is he? Okay, we'll move on, you just joined. Uh, so over to Hi, you, folks. Uh, Provost McCauley. Oops. Okay, thank you. Don't have any sound. Professor Braun, go ahead. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. I'm so sorry. I, uh, I thought we were starting at four today, folks. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm in Texas, so I'm sorry I can't join you guys um, in person today. Um, but I'm thrilled to be able to uh, provide you with some information from the Faculty Senate. Um, as the Regents are aware, uh, we were able to, in May, uh, have a vote to improve to uh, expand our membership from originally about 4,000 individuals who were mostly tenure track faculty and research track of faculty to include additional 3,000 individuals who mostly were clinical track faculty with some additional lecturers, archivists, and curators. So our body is now over 7,000 people strong. Um, I did wanna share with you and I sort of characterized our work into work that we've been doing with Provost McCauley and work that we've been doing uh, with President Ono. Um, this year, we have collaborated and worked hard with the provost uh, to, to have a, a survey of the salaries on the U of M campuses. And we're starting with the tenure track faculty here in Ann Arbor. Um, and we're really hopeful that uh, this, this uh, report can, can begin going soon and produce some interesting results um, in the spring for not only our campus, but then to be a, a wonderful model for our other campuses and our other faculty members. Uh, we're also attempting this year to begin looking at the oversight systems that we have here at the university, um, primarily the faculty grievance system, which was first created in 2010, and we think needs some improvements um, now at this time. And we're also trying to figure out how perhaps the region's bylaws and standard practice guides uh, can be modified to look at the idea of sanctions and how they relate to tenure and what exactly falls under region's bylaw 509 um, and what doesn't? We still hear a lot of confusion both between faculty and administrators on exactly how um, how to enforce the expectations that faculty have while still maintaining um, the rights that tenure brings to us. Uh, with regard to working with President Ono, um, we've been thrilled to get going with discussions about dependent care concerns. Uh, we recently had a survey that we sent out to all University of Senate members to assess their needs. And uh, we've already shared those results with President Ono and EVP uh, Jeff Chattis, also with the provost. And then I will be sharing the results with all of my colleagues at Senate Assembly this coming Monday. And we had a tremendous response rate of almost 1,100 individuals. And I think it really shocked me at just um, what a topic this is and, and how important it is to individuals that they were willing to respond to a survey um, and provide us with some really important information. Uh, we're really thrilled that Michelle Casey is joining us soon uh, to be the inaugural director of the newly created Ethics, Integrity, and Compliance Office. And Sakua is uh, would be thrilled to be having a direct link toward her uh, to provide information on how this, this office is going to operate on campus. Uh, those are some of the major goals that we've had this year. And of course, um, as with all good plans, sometimes they, they get superseded by other issues. And not surprisingly, uh, the major issue on faculty minds right now uh, remains the, the continued campus tensions uh, related to the war in Gaza. 
Um, as you are aware, the Senate Assembly did recently pass a resolution asking for publicly available information on the University of Michigan's financial investments in Israel. Um, but at a more local level, uh, many faculty have expressed discomfort and might I even say fear about trying to talk with students and other, their other colleagues about the current campus tensions. Um, there is also a challenging intersection with this issue in academic freedom, uh, whereby classroom conversations are leading to students who fear retaliation yeah, by Jimmy's faculty. Yeah, granddaughter, Jimbo's eldest. Brother. And faculty who fear retaliation by students, um, and even retaliation online from parents of students. And so many faculty, including myself, are, are truly lost right now without being better equipped with encountering these conversations that are quite risky um, for all campus individuals. And so this coming Monday at Senate Assembly, we're going to attempt to have a 30 minute conversation to start hearing what faculty actually think they'd like uh, to have done for the situation. I'm hearing from both students and faculty looking for faculty governance to pick a side, uh, to argue and to demand specific actions. Um, but instead, um, I and many others are hopeful we can generate ideas for administration in which we can begin having in-person conversations among faculty, students, and staff that are less polarized and, and can provide support for everyone who needs help right now. And just finally, uh, on a personal note, I, I really would like to thank President Ono for his most recent message to the university, um, as well as to the regents who endorsed that message. Um, whether or not we on campus all agree on the termination of any future consideration of the two CS, CSG petitions, um, I hope we can all agree that, uh, quote, it does have to stop. Uh, and with that, I thank you for allowing me to speak. Well, Tom, I want to thank you for your leadership and all the work and those surveys have provided us with uh, very important information in terms of how we can support faculty moving forward. And thanks for your uh, last comment, we certainly want to work with you and the entire community uh, and uh, to move uh, towards more peace uh, in the world, but also uh, on this campus. So thank you for your leadership with that. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you about how that conversation goes with uh, the Senate and SACWA. So thank you, Tom. All best Welcome. wishes to you in Texas. <laughs> thank you. All right. We're now going to move on to the consent agenda. And... Uh, um, the minutes and reports uh, are on the website if you're interested in looking at the actual minutes of the past meeting. And we're going to move on to the um, UM Health System Report with EVP Rangi. Thank you, President Ono. Uh, today I'm pleased to share a few updates about Michigan Medicine. The first is a very positive rec recognition in October by Newsweek that Michigan Medicine has been named the best hospital in the state of Michigan. Uh, scores for each hospital were calculated from peer recommendations, patient experience data, hospital quality metrics, and patient outcomes. Uh, these rankings were also based on national online survey of tens of thousands of healthcare professionals about leading hospitals that they would recommend. In another nationwide review of hospital and health systems, UM Health ranked number five by Nurse Jour Journal for being one of the best places to work as a nurse in 2023. Nurse Journal is a career and educational resource website. They used data from CMS and the ANCC magnet program to determine the top 30 hospitals. The top 15 were then selected based on patient satisfaction, staffing levels, safety measures, nursing career opportunities and benefits, and nurse ratings. So we're very pleased about both of those uh, rankings. Um, you may know that earlier this year we implemented a STAR ratings for our clinical faculty. This is a rating program that is done in partnership with Press Ganey, uh, who collects and collate, collates the data and calculates the scores for us. It's one of and perhaps the most uh, recognized and respected uh, STAR rating of physicians uh, available online. And in our first report from them, our faculty received an average of 4.9 STARS which we're told is one of the highest ratings ever seen by Press Ganey. So uh, great congratulations to our faculty. And finally, a quick update on our special pharmacy, uh, specialty pharmacy, which is a new facility in Dexter. This is a highly automated pharmacy anticipated to begin fulfilling automated prescriptions in January. The specialty pharmacy will also become home to a fleet of drones. 
in the future, which will have the capacity to deliver prescription drugs to patient homes within a 10 mile radius. We expect a 3D model of the drone base in the coming weeks and planning and for implementing this service will continue through 2024. The drone delivery is another value added service uh, which will enable us to offer our patients uh, effi efficient and rapid delivery, volume throughput and sustainability as its carbon imprint is very low. Uh, lastly, later in the agenda, you'll be, the regents will be asked to vote on a strategic alliance between the University of Michigan Health and Holland Hospital in Holland, Michigan. This alliance will benefit healthcare patients across West Michigan by allowing both organizations to identify and pursue opportunities that support high quality clinical services locally. We've enjoyed a collaborative and po positive relationship with Holland Hospital over the years, and we're enthusiastic for the opportunity to deepen our alliance to continue, to continue serving the evolving needs of our patients and the communities that we serve. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that report on the UM Health uh, System. Now we move on to the UM Dearborn Campus Report, Chancellor Grasso. Thank you, uh, President Dono. I am delighted to report that on December 16th, we will hold commencement. Our commencement speaker is going to be Bill Anaya, who is one of our graduates, and he's Vice President for Global Government Affairs for Coupang, which is the South Korean version of Amazon. So we're delighted to welcome him back. We'll have over 700 graduates, and, unlike, and very similar to the Ann Arbor campus and the Flint campus, a lot of our students come from around the world. And as they come to our campus, they bring with them unique names, and we have name readers. And unfortunately, some of our name readers have been stumbling over some of these names. So a year and a half ago, I asked our engineering and computer science faculty members and students to develop a software package where the students can record their own name ahead of time, and then they would use a QR code to scan it before they walk across stage. Uh, we have a patent pending on this now, and uh, some of the students balked at hearing their own name. So we suggested that they can ask one of their faculty members, a friend, and we have many moms who have volunteered to read their child's names as they walk across the stage. So we're excited to roll that out for the first time uh, on uh, commencement December 16th. Um, also, the Higher Learning Commission just issued its final report to us and this is the first time in our history that we get a 10-year clean bill of health. No negative comments, and I have to say that I, I am sure it was in large part due to Regent Bernstein and Regent Hubbard's lunch with them and uh, in support of our campus. So we're very excited about that. Um, earlier uh, last month, our National Advisory Committee met and at that meeting, uh, we had worked on this. One of our members uh, announced a $1 million gift to the campus, which was terrific. And uh, encourage, it, we are encouraging all the other members to join him in his generosity to the campus. Our student government has been very active. And to our knowledge, they are the first student government of all three campuses that have developed a student government code of ethics. So we're excited that they took that step forward. We are thinking about sending that on to the Supreme Court as an idea for them, but uh, we'll consider that uh, later. And uh, finally, 24-7 uh, 20, uh, Wall Street uh, issued a ranking, uh, not to be too outdone by the medical campus, uh, a ranking of upward mobility campuses in the United States. And, uh, the University of Michigan Dearborn was ranked 29th, and we were uh, five spots behind Stanford, two spots behind MIT, and 10 spots ahead of Yale. So we were very excited about that ranking, and we were the only campus in Michigan to make that list. So we're very proud of our upward mobility. Best wishes for a happy holiday season, and go blue and roll over the tide. Uh, thank you so much for that, Chancellor Grasso. And now move on to the UM Flint campus report, Chancellor Fry. Thank you, President Ono. The University of Michigan Flint has received a $30 million commitment from the state of Michigan to help fund phase two of the creation of an innovation and technology complex. The complex will comprise nearly 65,000 square feet of space 
and will feature state-of-the-art <laughs> instructional laboratories for applied technology disciplines with areas designed to encourage collaboration and interdisciplinary research. For the second year, the School of Management's Hagerman Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation is one of four finalists for the Excellence in Co-Curricular Innovation Award from the United States Association of Small Business and Entrepreneurship. USASBE is the world's largest organization devoted to entrepreneurship education by universities, making this one of the most prestigious awards a university can receive. Award recipients will be announced in January. The University of Michigan Flint has developed a generative AI prompt literacy course aimed to equip anyone to master the art of AI prompting. Attendees learn to construct prompts that make AI a practical, potent tool to accomplish user objectives, from drafting detailed reports to generating content to helping accelerate learning. And finally, former Representative Andy Levin and New York Times columnist Jamil Bui visited the University of Michigan Flint on November 30th for a moderated discussion on democracy, labor, and the future of work. This event, co-moderated by Professors Jacob Lederman and Kim Sachs, was part of the University of Michigan Flint's Borders and Crossings program, which offers first-year experience courses designed to help U of M Flint students gain the broad-based critical thinking skills necessary to understand an increasingly complex global society. Thank you. Thank you very much for your report, Chancellor Fry. We now move on to a report from the president of the Rackham Student Government, President Prevero. Prevero? Prevero. Prevero. Thank you. Um, president Ano, members of the Board of Regents, executive officers of the university, and members of the UM community. My name is Angelica Previero. I'm an international student and PhD candidate, and I am the president of the Rackham Student Government. And I'm honored and excited to share the 2023 RSG report. Before continu continuing with the report, I just wanted to acknowledge that a lot of members of our community feel heard and unheard. Um, and with that being said, these are the goals that RSG has worked on during the past year. We continue to promote community across the graduate student population through programming, both independently as well as in collaboration with other organizations and university offices. Examples of organized events include sustainability-oriented events, social events, wellness events, academic and professional workshop, and of course, free food. We also, continue <laughs> we also continue to address affordability concerns for graduate students. The impact of inflation and the rising cost of living in the area is severe, as the majority of graduate students are supported by fixed stipends and scholarship and especially impacts students, parents, and caregivers, international students, students of colors, older students, and LGBTQ plus identifying students. Our solution and contribution include connecting students to resources and the RSG basic needs um, microgram program which offers short-term financial assistance of up to $100 open to all graduate students. During the last iteration of the program, we were able to fund roughly $45,000 um, in applications. Notably, we were able to also support non rackham students through external sponsorships such as the law school and the central student government. This year's program will be launched next month. Um, we also focused on advocacy efforts and connecting graduate students with administration. A significant ad advocacy effort this past year was with regards to promoting positive mentor-mentee relationships and accountability in the more severe situations. We released a survey asking for students' experiences to inform our advocacy efforts while working with Dean Solomon, the Rackham Executive Board, on their initiative, which is the Statement of Rackham Graduate Faculty Values, Privileges, and Responsibilities. Um, finally, I also wanted to thank the Rackham deans and associate deans for their willingness to listen and connect with the graduate student populations, and we're honored to be able to facilitate these conversations th through lunches that we organize twice per term, one being on central campus and one being on north campus. Thank you all for your time and continued support. I'm always available to answer any questions and provide additional information. Sorry. 
Thank you very much for your report. And now we have a report from the Central Student Government President, President Hur. Good afternoon, President Ono, members of the Board of Regents, Executive Officers of the University, and members of the U of M community. As a reintroduction, my name is Mira Hurley, and I'm serving as this year's CSG President. I'm pleased to be here with you all today to provide a brief update on behalf of Central Student Government. Since we last convened in Ann Arbor in September, CSG has been very busy. In October, CSG facilitated a town hall about carbon neutrality on campus. We had about five staff members and administrators join us, including new AVP for campus sustainability, Shauna Weber, to discuss student perspectives on the transition to carbon neutrality at U of M. We're looking forward to sharing takeaways from this event with stakeholders shortly. Also in October, in collaboration with the Urban Planning Students Association, CSG ran an educational and interactive workshop about the Ann Arbor comprehensive planning process and affordable housing generally in Ann Arbor. This event was very successful and we gathered data on student opinions that we'll be sharing with the city's planning commission. In November, CSG ran another successful iteration of our Airbus program, which provides students with discounted rides to and from the airport during common travel times. Our ridership over Thanksgiving break was great with over 800 students using the service. We look forward to offering the service again as students travel to and from campus during winter break. Finally, as the semester comes to a close, our team has been very focused on mental health promoting initiatives. Throughout November, Vice President Bapasha Ray has been working with students, faculty, and staff to co-author the Wellbeing Collective's Common Agenda. CSG also held our chill out event last week on the Diag, and that event featured an outdoor synthetic ice rink, cookies and hot cocoa, and nine different well-being focused student organizations and university units tabling and providing direct outreach to students to advocate or to advertise their services, excuse me. Based upon an attendance survey we ran at that event, we estimate turnout at the event was over 500 students. And then finally, as we head into an exam season for students this afternoon, CSG is running two tables at the Shapiro Undergraduate Library and the Deuterstadt Library, where students can build final survival kits to get them through this stressful time of the year. The last two months have not been easy by any means. It feels as though almost every individual on our campus has felt the impacts of global conflict more personally than we all could have imagined at the start of the semester. I know myself and many of my colleagues have constantly questioned how CSG can best support students in times of immense uncertainty and angst. We have struggled through decisions that seem to put the elevation of student voices and advocacy at odds with campus mental health and well-being. We are conscious of the opportunities for us all to learn and grow in this moment, to engage in respectful and educational conversations, and to the best of our ability to care for one another across differences. I hope you all will join me in recognizing now as a moment for us to heal and move forward as a stronger community. And in line with that, I'm looking forward to everything the future holds for the Hurley Ray administration and finishing up our term on a powerful note, engaging with issues such as affordability, campus safety, and mental health next semester, and doing so with a renewed commitment to collaboration and transparency. We are grateful for all of your support and partnership in bettering the student experience, and that's for all students on this campus. As many of you know, our door is always open. Should you have any questions or concerns, please contact csg.president at umich.edu if you'd like to get in touch. Thank you again for allowing me to speak with you all today. President Hurley, can I, before you step down, just uh, thank you on behalf of the university for your leadership during a very difficult time. Uh, it's difficult to be a student, it's difficult to be a CSG president, it's particularly difficult during these sorts of moments. And I want you to know on behalf of the entire university and me personally, that I'm grateful for your leadership during this time. Thank you, I appreciate that. And we're now moving on to um, uh, the retirement memoirs that are in your uh, materials. Um, and uh, uh, the section on degrees, which are also uh, in the materials. And I would like to now call for a vote on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, same sign. Anyone abstaining, same sign. The consent agenda is approved unanimously. We now move on to the regular agenda of the meeting, item number four. Uh, EVP Chad is to speak about the Electric Vehicle Center Battery Laboratory Expansion. Nothing to add, Mr. President. Thank you so much. I'm very excited about this. Um, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? That motion passes uh, unanimously. 
Observatory Hall Reserve Officers Training Corps Space Renovation, EVP Chattis. Nothing to add, Mr. President. Is there any? Is there a motion to approve? So motion to approve. Second. Second. I note Kathy White, I think. Uh, all, all in favor? Uh, Say aye. 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 Uh, um, anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? Uh, moves forward. Uh, UM Dearborn Rennick University Center first floor renovations. EBP Chattis? Nothing to add, Mr. President. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Same sign. Aye. aye. Uh, anyone abstaining? Okay. I think the motion passes unanimously with a delayed aye. Um, and the School of Nursing Building 1, Classroom and Interior Renovation, EVP Chattis? Nothing to add, Mr. President. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Same sign. Anyone abstaining? Same sign. The School of Nursing Building 1, Classroom and Interior Renovation Project has been approved unanimously. We now move on to supplemental items uh, in today's uh, meeting agenda. The L. Bell Field Update, EVP Chattis. Thank you, Mr. President. As you and the board know from previous meetings, the new Albell Field will provide a wonderfully improved facility for the Michigan Marching Band, Go Blue, who we have consulted with closely through the relocation process. I'm returning to the board today to request approval of a budget increase involving a crushed storm sewer pipe under the field. The original design called for it to be replaced in its current location. However, at the city's request, the design was updated to place it in the right of way instead. This is preferable to the university as it protects our investment by avoiding future disturbances on the field and ensures the city can conduct prompt maintenance as needed. The complexity and time needed to make this change will result in extra costs, but will be better for the Michigan Marching Band and the city in the long run. Therefore, I recommend this action item for approval. Thank you. Is there a motion to move? Second? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone aye. opposed? Same sign. Anyone abstaining? Same sign. The Elbell Field uh, update has been approved. We move on to the Mary Grove housing lease. Uh, Provost McCauley and EVP Chattis. Thank you, President Ono. At the request of the Provost's Office to expand innovative program offerings, the Marsal Family School of Education is preparing to offer a novel four-year undergraduate degree program on learning, equity, and problem solving called LEAPS with a special residential experience for one year on the campus of the former Mary Grove College, now home to the Mary Grove Learning Community a Detroit P20 partnership in Northwest Detroit. The program was approved by the Provost Office and by MASU in 2022. LEAPS is a one-of-a-kind undergraduate degree program in which students develop the skills to become change makers who effectively partner with peers, communities, and organizations. LEAPS blends the capabilities of a leading public research university with community-based learning in Detroit. First-year students live and learn together on the Mary Grove campus as a cohort before defining individualized career pathways. LEAP students will learn through research and community action projects led by neighborhood organizations like the Center for Black Entrepreneurship, Detroit Future City, and Focus Hope. The students' work will draw from the learning sciences to solve problems in community-driven ways in areas including education, urban planning and civil, civil engineering, public health, public policy, neighborhood revitalization, and community health projects. The initial cohort of 20 to 25 first-year students will enroll in fall of 2024. We are extremely excited to be working on this important investment in the city of Detroit's future. We envision that the LEAPS program will be a draw for Detroit youth to apply to the University of Michigan. Now I would like to hand it off to EVP Chattis. Thank you, Provost McCauley. To support this amazing new educational opportunity, we are seeking your approval today for the lease agreements that will keep the project on track in preparation for our first students. I'm excited these students will soon have a chance to experience this unique educational opportunity, and I recommend this action request for approval. Is there a motion to approve? Second. 
Second. All those in favor, please Second. say aye. 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 Anyone aye. opposed, please say aye. Anyone abstaining, please say aye. Motion passes unanimously. We now move on to the conflict of interest items, items eight to 20, each of which requires six votes for approval. Does any region have any questions about items eight through 20? If so, let us know. Seeing none, I'd like to say that um, uh, Regent Hubbard will recuse herself from item 10. So we'll vote on that in isolation. So would any regions like to request recusal from voting of any of the other items eight through 20? If so, let me know. Seeing no none, voting now on eight through 20 minus number 10. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Second. All those in favor, please raise, raise your hands so we can count. Aye. And I have my hand raised. My right hand is raised. Uh, it, it passes. Thank you so much. Um, now, um, there's a motion to approve item 10, the Fresh Start Clubhouse. Is there a motion? Second. 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 All in favor, please show of hands so we can make sure there are six. One, two, three on Zoom. My right hand's raised. Hand Four, raised. five. You need one more. Six. Six. Okay, wonderful. Item 10 is approved as well. We now move on to other items. Uh, uh, on the Department of Voice, uh, renaming as the Department of Voice and Opera. Provost McCauley? Nothing to add. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say aye. aye. Anyone Abstaining, same sign. The department change has been approved unanimously. Establishment of the Technology Department, College of Innovation and Technology, University of Michigan, Flint. Uh, Chancellor Fry, do you want to say anything? Nothing to add. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone aye. opposed? Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? The Technology Department has been established unanimously, Chancellor Fry. Um, now on to the College of Arts and Sciences, University of Michigan, Flint, again. Approval of the change of the name of the College of Arts and Sciences to the College of Arts and Sciences and Education. Chancellor Fry, would you like to comment? Nothing to add. Okay, is there a motion to approve? Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, same sign. Anyone abstaining, same sign. The cha name change of the college has been approved unanimously, Chancellor Fry. Now we move on to the Holland Hospital Strategic Alliance, EVP Run Rungi. Nothing to add. Is there a motion to approve? Some. Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Same sign. Anyone abstaining? Same sign. The Holland, Holland Hospital Strategic Alliance has been unanimously approved. Uh, and now we move on to public comments. Uh, E.P. Churchill. Thank you. We will continue with the rules stated earlier. Uh, under our new policy, which is effective this month, some speakers have five minutes, some have two, depending on the number of people that signed up for the same topic. So our first speaker is someone who will be, have up to five minutes, and that is Rowan Antar. Um, before I speak, I'd like to request that Zachariah Farah speaks, the first speaker, as he was outside in line waiting to come in when his name was called. Do you want him to speak? Yeah, he wasn't here. When he, was he wasn't here at the time. That was an, an agenda-related topic, so he gave up his opportunity. So, sorry. I've already voted on. It's already been voted on. So, you can speak now. The timer's going off. Okay. No, I mean the called speaker. Oh, no. So because I, although I've signed up for public comment, you're not allowing me to give public comment. I don't know, who are you? My name is Zachariah. No, you were late. It was earlier in the meeting. Me you said there, you were speaking on an agenda item that's already been voted on. So we're moving on. If people aren't here, we move on. So um, we're now eating into the time that Rowan got. We're, Patrick, please start the timer for the five minutes. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, esteemed members of the Board of Regents, President Ono, faculty and fellow students. My name is Rowan Antar and I stand here today as the co-president of the Arab Student Association and a member of the Tahrir Coalition, the largest, most diverse coalition our university has ever seen, encompassing over 63 different student organizations. I'm here risking my own personal safety as an Arab woman to express deep concerns regarding the racist attacks that Palestinian Arab and Muslim students have been facing at the university. Despite our persistent attempts, you have refused to meet with the coalition for the past two months. You have refused if we have handed you evidence, overwhelming evidence of racist and harassment faced by our students, and you have refused even as the genocide in Palestine prevails, putting the current death toll at over 20,000. In your most recent statement, you stated, and I quote, in one particular instance, two of our students have been targeted, slandered, and harassed after being accused of stealing a list of campus emails. The students have faced angry calls for their expulsions, hateful intimidation, and physical threats. Let's be clear. These are not just any students. They are my friends. They are Palestinian Arab Muslim women, and their doxing was not accidental. They were systematically targeted because of deliberate neglect of this administration and the insidious attacks on student democracy last week when the university chose to compromise CSG elections, even as you allowed outside interferences that were heavily linked to the Twitter account that doxed them. In your recent statement to students, you claim to be listening. But where were you when a doxing truck sponsored by alums for campus fairness drove around campus for an entire day? depicting Muslim women as terrorists and attacking hardworking faculty members that teach students and serve this institution in countless ways. Where were you when a donor associated with a DI fellowship attacked one of your students during a peaceful protest, stating, and I quote, are you going to send one of your terrorists after us? It is precisely this racist language that leads to the death of a six-year-old Palestinian boy in Illinois, and more recently, the shooting of three Palestinian college students, just like me, in Vermont. These words aren't abstractions, these words have killed. And where were you when over 10 different police forces were sent to attack your own students who were simply waiting in your office for over four hours for a simple meeting with their own president? And where were you before October 7th, when Palestinian and Arab students were demonstrating peacefully in the Diag and were harassed, bullied, and intimidated? Our identity and heritage was insulted and our people dehumanized by our own community members. We all know that harmful racism is not just about the past two months, but something black and brown students have been witnessing for so long long in this powerful institution that you represent. Your letter goes on to say that you will disallow any future votes on two controversial and divisive central student government resolutions, AR-13025 and AR-13026, related to the ongoing violence in Israel and Gaza. You claim that the proposed resolution have done more to stoke fear, anger, and animosity on our campus than they would ever accomplish as recommendations to the university. I'm here to comment on this misleading claim regarding resolution AR-13025 which asks for the protection and the recognition of marginalized student communities, a resolution that dares to demand accountability and transparency from this powerful public institution. This undemocratic suppression of resolution AR-13025 only seeks to protect your pockets and your $18 billion endowment. In 1978, responding to the movement against South African apartheid, the Board of Regents adopted a resolution including the following language. If the Regents shall determine that a particular issue involves serious moral or ethical questions, which are of concern to many members of the university community, an advisory committee would be established to investigate whether a particular issue might require a deviation from the normal investment policy, which otherwise emphasized profit over anything else. Time and time again, you have refused to consider the ethical implications of investing and profiting off genocide. Why is our safety and the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians not a serious enough moral or ethical concern for you? You claim that your investments are not political, but only driven by market forces. I want to ask you, how is investing over 30 million in the shekel, a highly unstable currency, not a purely political investment in the ongoing genocide in Palestine? You must know that it's precisely your negligence that directly paves the way for violent racism against our community. It is your negligence of our collective pain and vulnerability that makes us fear for our safety and increasingly our lives on this campus every day. Let me remind you that this is a public institution that must be accountable to the people of this university, all of its diverse student faculty and staff. You have the duty to represent the people of the state who elected you, a state with the largest concentration of Arab American and Muslims. I have spent the last two months as a student leader being afraid and sad to be a part of a university that refuses to acknowledge and protect us. But I'm here to tell you that it's not too late to do the right thing. As members of the same collective community, I'm here to ask you to respect our humanity just as we respect yours and divest from apartheid. Thank you all. 
Our next speaker is Charles Davis III. Good afternoon. My name is Charles H.F. Davis III, faculty member and director of the Campus Abolition Research Lab here at the Ann Arbor campus. <clears throat> I would like to thank the board for the opportunity to address this body on matters of campus racism and institutional repression of student activism, my areas of scholarly expertise. As is well known, during a peaceful demonstration on November 17th, students from a diverse coalition representing 60 allied organizations were met overwhelmingly by police officers from nearly a dozen different departments. Student accounts reported in the Michigan Daily noted armed police used physical force to prevent entry to this building during hours of operation, as well as engaged in physically displacing students that led to at least two injuries, religious indignities against Muslim students, and infringement on the dignitary safety of numerous others. These instances of brutality occurred following intensified harassment and suppression of Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim students during the ongoing genocide in Hassa. As a scholar, faculty member, and concerned campus citizen, the aforementioned actions and their enablement by the institution are wholly reprehensible. They have no place on a college campus that espouses a strong commitment to student safety and are ideologically inconsistent with the president's communicated interest in enhancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, embracing decolonization, and his promise to support an unarmed, non-police emergency response. We are witnessing an extremely repressive climate as further emblematized by the continued use of law enforcement to limit and bar student attendance at today's meeting, which discourages students from acting as leaders and best on society's most intractable problems, especially as they manifest on the campus in which we live, work, and learn. I would like to encourage this board to exercise moral and political courage necessary at this particular time of controversy and challenge. Lest we forget the precedents established by previous regents, including the March 16, 1978 resolution in which this body rhetorically condemned South African apartheid as, I quote, oppressive, immoral, and unconscionable. The current moment presents yet another opportunity to take decisive action in reaffirming a clear ethic regarding settler apartheid through changing institutional investment practices and severing financial entanglements with apartheid regimes. This also offers a unique chance to demonstrate courageous leadership expected by our university among AAUP and Big Ten institutions, leadership that takes seriously the role as a power source to directly energize rather than stifle campus political engagement, support institutional leaders in leveraging expertise already present on campus to provide more nuanced understandings of polarizing issues with empirical precision and unshakable moral clarity. All right, our next speaker is Yaman Sada. Good afternoon, the President Ono, members of the Board of Regents, executive officers of the university, fellow faculty and students. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Dr. Yaman Sadeh. I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery and I direct the brachial plexus and peripheral nerve program. I'm a 2010 LSA graduate. I was born at Old Mont Hospital. My daughter was born at Newmont Hospital. My dad moved from the West Bank of Palestine in the 1980s to U of M to get his PhD. Our connection to the university is extremely deep and runs across multiple generations. Uh, and our very Michigan family is in a lot of pain right now. Uh, there comes a time when we have to make tough choices and we have to do the right thing, the ethical thing. In my own medical practice, I encounter this very frequently. And myself and other physicians, we have to, we're guided by our oaths, the most important of which is to first do no harm. So today I ask for self-reflection in the setting of current world events in campus events. Has our beloved university been following the simple ethical maxim of do no harm? When a college advisory board member physically and verbally attacked Arab and Muslim students and was not punished, even though it was on video, was that doing no harm? When the university silenced the voices of the Michigan student body seeking a resolution to condemn the violence, uh, was that doing no harm? When representatives of dozens of vulnerable student organizations were begging, please, for two months, just meet with us, hear our concerns, hear what we're going through, and for two months were rebuffed, was that doing no harm? When a Palestinian child in Gaza is being killed every 10 minutes for the past two months, when two million people are made homeless, starved, cut off from the world, when hospitals are destroyed and doctors like me are being killed, civilians bombed in an open-air camp they can't escape from, and our university doesn't even consider divesting from the government that's doing these crimes. Is that doing no harm? The mission of the University of Michigan is to serve the people of Michigan and the world through knowledge, academic values, and developing future leaders and involved citizens. But first, we must do no harm. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Elise Hacking, who also has five minutes.
Good afternoon. My name is Elise Hawking, and I'm speaking to you today in three capacities, as a law student, a graduate student instructor, and student leader within Hillel and the Jewish Law Students Association. Our campus community is fractured, grieving, and scared. As students are grieving, organizing, and attempting to make sense of the Hamas-Israel war and how it's changing our campus community, most professors have not been addressing the war in supportive and constructive ways. Jewish students are being completed with the Israeli Defense Forces and Palestinian students with Hamas. Of course, not all professors are handling the war in the same way. Some are encouraging students to join efforts to condemn and divest from Israel. Some are making mass comments about the war without explicitly naming Israel or Hamas. Some professors are making assumptions about how students' identities or political commitments will map onto the war. And some professors are ignoring the war and the resulting highly charged campus environment entirely. But very few professors are acknowledging the war and its effects on students in ways that attend to the student's grief and facilitate constructive discussion across beliefs, identities, and experiences. Jewish and Palestinian students and all those with deep emotional investments in the futures of both people are struggling to learn in classroom environments that insufficiently meet the needs of our fractured and grieving campus community. Students do not feel safe, are not able to focus, or supported in classroom environments that fail to acknowledge the ongoing violence, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and hostility that students are experiencing every day. In my role as a GSI, I've witnessed my students struggle to process the violence since October 7th, the unfolding war, and the discourse on campus. I feel lucky that the professor for whom I GSI thoughtfully addresses the ongoing impact of the war in our class discussions, on our community, and on students' well-being. But many GSIs have not, given, have not been given this guidance or support to facilitate these productive discussions. Students feel that their grief, fear, and overwhelm is being ignored while the campus climate continues to intensify and strengthen divide between students. Many Jewish and Palestinian students feel alienated by their peers, student organizations, and professors who appear indifferent to their experiences and proliferate inflammatory language. On October 18th, GEO invited all GSIs to attend a teach-in and save night of remembrance for our Martyrs in Palestine event. The email heightened the rampant Islamophobia and the anti-Arab racism experienced by Muslim students. However, there was no mention of Hamas, the October 7th attack, or the rampant anti-Semitism experienced by Jewish students. Jews' communications continued to propagate only anti-Israel rhetoric and promoted the events of student organizations that call for the elimination of Israel and failed to recognize the experiences of Jewish GSIs and Jewish students. So I left the union. And I've witnessed other students experience this upsetting alienation from their student organization, including in many instances in the law school. Jewish and Palestinian students alike should be able to participate in student organizations without the expectation of ignoring their community's intense emotions and experiences of the ongoing war. Rhetoric surrounding the Hamas-Israel war pervades all areas of students' lives. We experience this in the classroom, on the diag, in our student organizations, and in our friend groups. This is not an issue contained to activist groups, but rather affects all students on campus, whether directly or indirectly. As students cannot and often do not want to escape these conversations, intense discussions regarding the war will continue to occur, even when these conversations leave all parties angry, silenced, and upset. The university seeks to educate and prepare its students to serve our campus and world as leaders and citizens. To enact this mission, the university needs to provide its educators and students with the resources to productively engage in difficult, emotionally charged conversations. The university must continue to work to make sure that this campus is safe for all students, including Palestinian and Jewish students whose identities and communities are under attack. As we experience this ongoing grief, violence, existential threats, and exacerbated religious hatred of this war, I call upon the university to better equip students and our professors to engage in challenging conversations rather than continuing to witness these conversations unfold in unconstructive and inflammatory ways. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tyler Fiorito. Before I speak, I actually have uh, some copies of the formal proposal. Uh, if I, I don't know how to. You can give them to Patrick standing behind you who has a timer. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. All right, this timer started. Sorry. Yep. Oh, okay. Sorry. My bad. Um, 
It's good to be back. Uh, I was actually at the Flint meeting back in uh, October. Uh, that was a very interesting meeting. Uh, I'd never actually been to the Flint campus before, but it was nice uh, to see that there's actually a vibrant community of U of M students up there. Um, and I actually got to speak with a lot of the Flint students afterwards who were in the audience about an election day holiday. Uh, and everyone seemed to pretty much agree that it's a good and realistic idea uh, for the 2024 year. And because last time was sort of a hypothetical idea for an election day holiday, I actually talked to student leaders, uh, both inside government and just orgs, and we got together a formal proposal based on the winter break extension of earlier this year and formatted it in a way where the only thing that would be amended is an election day holiday. So during this time, not only did we talk about the idea, we made sure that the actual schedule would remain intact otherwise. Um, and yeah, that's actually what uh, hopefully we'll get up to the, that end of the table over there. Uh, so this would amend the fall schedule to create an election day holiday on November 5th, 2024, uh, which would reduce the number of total days from 70 to 69, uh, but that would be equal with fall and winter. And historically, we looked in 2022, 2023, that was also 69 days for fall, 69 days for winter. Uh, and the current year we're in right now is 67 for fall, 69 for winter. So we feel that a 69-69 split between fall and winter would be more than reasonable. Uh, and the only interest I have here is to get this done, uh, to get an election day holiday in whatever form that takes. And I would be more than happy to ask, uh, ask questions and also answer questions from the board uh, on this proposal. Uh, thank you. We want to thank you. We, we spoke about you earlier today. And really understand and we are supportive of the goal and aim of getting more students to actually vote. Um, the one thing we want to be very careful about is there's some data out there at other institutions that it's actually counterproductive, that if there's an election day, that it might actually have a negative impact on, on situations, especially here where there's a lot of, uh, uh, you can vote over a period of time virtually. And so um, we do want to look at it. I received your email, I don't know if it was from you directly a couple of days ago or today, uh, so I want to thank you. I did receive it. And I want you to know that we have talked about it. We're thinking about it. But I uh, wanted to be very clear with you about that concern. We don't want to do anything that would actually uh, have a counterproductive impact on, on vo voter turnout from our students. Absolutely. I mean, that's totally that. I mean, the whole point of getting a turnout uh, up would be the holiday. And I totally get you. Uh, I would love to know uh, the other institutions and compare them. I spoke with some people at EMU and also MSU, which I believe both have uh, an election day holiday in place. And I believe their turnout, uh, I, I would love to be corrected if I'm wrong here, is slightly higher percentage wise for the young demographic there than ours. So I don't know if we're seeing that there in those trends, but uh, obviously there's hundreds of other schools out there. So if that is the case, I would love to know that. We'll definitely look into it and, and we really appreciate your work and, and put into this uh, proposal and just want to be very transparent with you about what we're thinking about. So thank you. And we'll be back in touch with you. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Regent Ellich. Yeah, I just want to uh, yeah. push your button. Oh, sorry. I just want to applaud you for your enthusiasm and keep it up. Okay. Cause we want to get to a hundred percent. So. I appreciate the discourse here. We can't guys, do it this way. We'll yeah. figure out a, you know, collaborate. We'll collaborate and try to figure out a, another way to get 100% participation. But um, stay fired up about it, okay? I will stay fired Good up work. all the time, right? Good work. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Connor Sin Vanderbeck. Board of Regents, President Ono, Executive Officers. My name is Connor Singh Vanderbeek. I'm a PhD candidate in SMTD, and I am speaking on behalf of GEO. On September 21st, 2023, President Santa J. Ono offered a statement of support for the development of an unarmed non-police emergency response program that serves the university of community. The need for this program arises from the continued over-policing, dehumanization, and murder of black people by police across this country. Many of us remember Ara Rosser, the woman who was fatally shot by Ann Arbor police in 2014, and Samuel DeBose, the unarmed black man who was killed by campus police at 20, in 2015 at the University of Cincinnati during Santa Ono's tenure there. My remarks address how President Ono has mobilized police to suppress dialogue with students. Since late October, a diverse coalition of now over 70 student organizations has been protesting the university's non-response to the ongoing siege of Gaza. 
what the UN Commission on Human Rights has called a campaign of ethnic cleansing. On November 17th, the university deployed roughly 60 police officers from over 10 precincts to suppress a peaceful protest at the Ruthven building designed to open dialogue with President Ono. A multi-ethnic and interfaith group of 40 students was arrested and banned from future entry to Ruthven, all for wanting to speak to the president. These armed officers exercised a disproportionate and frankly unprecedented amount of force towards Palestinian students, in addition to black, Muslim, and Arab students and student allies, including verbal assault, removal of hijabs, and body slams. One student was detained by cops in Ruthven today, and we currently do not know where he is. The core values of DPSS include service to our community, trust, respect, and support of our community, and an environment where our community feels welcome and safe. In the past month, we have seen a clear failure by university police to uphold these values. In response, I ask why is President Ono chosen to mobilize police against protesters instead of opening dialogue with students? What was the monetary cost to the university and to the taxpayers in mobilizing this large police force against 300 peacefully protesting students? When can we as members of the community expect, expect President Ono to officially launch the unarmed non-police emergency response program? And given the aforementioned failures of DPSS to its community, how will the administration ensure that this program is designed, launched, and operated according to the needs of the community it purportedly serves? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is- Mr. Mr. President, can I ask a quick question, please, before- Sure. Boy, thank you so much. And thank you for your comments today. I really, I really do appreciate it. You, you mentioned that you, there was someone that, uh, from the protest, you don't know where they are. Can you- This is today. Somebody was trying to attend the meeting in Ruth Van and they were detained by police and we're trying as a group to figure out where they currently are and we don't know. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Samara Ahmed. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Samira Ahmed, a licensed clinical psychologist, alum, a parent of two current students and a former lecturer at the University of Michigan. I'm also the executive director of the Family and Youth Institute. I specialize in Muslim mental health and community psychology. Board of Regents, President Ono, your public statements and refusal to meet with students erases pro-Palestinian voices, Arabs, Muslims, Jewish, students, and over 70 other student organizations, rendering them less than equal. You allow racism to accelerate un unabated on this campus, on my children, on my patients. There, in the past two weeks alone, there have been 30 incidents against Muslim students on campus, and there has been a reported increase of 300% Islamophobia cases, many of them coming from students. Mental health concerns are abound. Students and faculty are reporting a rise in fear, anxiety, and depression. Some people can't even leave their homes. They're unable to do their work and fulfill academic obligations. They are confronting trauma daily, experiencing harassment on campus, and experiencing grieving the genocide, as well as experiencing cognitive dissonance because their university promotes DEI values, but draws a hard line when it comes to Palestine. In 60 days of requests and nearly a dozen protests, you have failed to meet with your students. How do you think this contributes to learned helplessness and impacts their trauma? They are victims of institutional racism. They know they don't matter. It's more collateral damage. On campus, the climate for BIPOC students has become toxic, impacting their mental health and academics. This Thank is you. continued erasure and failure to leadership. This is what needs to stop. 
prioritize healing on campus, address the root of the problems, and establish an institutional strategy to counter Islamophobia and anti-Palestinian racism with resources and programming as a significant priority in DEI okay. 2.0. Okay, as I noted, when Diverse people don't abide by the rules, any military, including the one currently the conducting future. genocide against Palestinian civilians, listen to your students. Our next speaker is Hannah Chung. Can I just, uh, Samira, can I just say thank you for that? And if you could email me, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about what you described. And, and thanks for taking the time to come here and advocate for students that you see in your, your, own, your own children who are students. So thank you very much. Hannah? Good evening. I'm Hannah Chung, a current student and alum. I'm speaking on behalf of alumni of UMish for Palestine. I love my school. I truly do. But you are making it very, very hard to love it anymore. My father and grandfather both also attended UMish, and it's very close to my heart. But with the actions taken against students taking a stand against injustice, you have made me and many alumni very ashamed to call ourselves Wolverines. I graduated from U of M in 2021. I got a great education here, most importantly, learning how to think critically. I also learned how to be a citizen of the world, making decisions based on a clear moral compass, compassion for all people, social justice, and equal rights. But my pride has turned into shame. U of M admin must do better on protecting students' rights, respecting their right to protest, and creating an environment free of discrimination. For all of the time, energy, and money the University of Michigan spends talking about diversity and inclusion, they continue to fail the people, like me, Hana, who actually benefit. Diversity and inclusion are simply buzzwords that the university uses to try to absolve itself of its unending offenses to people of color near and far. The support and investment in an apartheid state is beyond shameful, it is abhorrent. It is a stain on the University of Michigan and only serves to reinforce your dedication to upholding white supremacy while pretending to be a respectable institution. The decision to not only support but also fund Israel's crimes against Palestinians, Africans, their own citizens, and beyond ensures that you can be sure you will not be getting another dollar from me, my family, or our general Asian American community here in Ann Arbor, Ipsy, and Metro Detroit. If you do not divest as soon as possible, Instead of claiming to be the leaders in the best, actually put those words to action and take a real stand against genocide. Not in the future when it's popular, but now when it's needed. I hope every regent in Santa Ono is tortured by this decision and the bloodshed they have continued to support. Thank you. Our next speaker is Penny Tony. Hello everyone, my name is Penny Tony, and I am the president of UMAP, the United Michigan Medicine Allied Professionals, AFT uh, 6739. Our union is comprised of six uh, separate bargaining units that are cur currently in varying stages of recognition. We're very excited to announce that our second bargaining unit has been officially recognized by the university at 3.50 p.m. today. And our third bargaining unit is in the, in the process of getting their card checks done as we speak. All of our members of UMAP play vital roles in providing comprehensive patient care from CT technologists like myself, surgical technologists and medical technologists, physical therapists, social workers, and our medical assistants. These are just a few, name a few of the job titles that we represent and that make Michigan Medicine the place it is today. On behalf of UMAP, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for your dedication and efforts to enact the neutrality cause, which help us recognize our first bargaining unit in February of 2023. Um, this unit is called ADEPT, which is the Advanced Diagnostic Emergency Procedures Technologist, and we are currently at the bargaining table. As we begin this process of negotiations, my hope is that we can form a strong partnership to ensure the, a fair contract that reflects the world-class care that we provide to all of our patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, Regent Illich. Oh, Tom. Um, thank you for your comments. We welcome working together, and thanks for all the work that you and your unit do. Thank you. 
President, I'd like to just speak briefly as well, just to congratulate you on your second bargaining unit, and we look forward to, to working with you. Congratulations on unionizing. Our final speaker is Mr. Mogelson. Go back in December of 2016, you bought a hospital for $200 million out by Grand Rapids. It was an interesting situation. There was a publicly financed, locally publicly financed hospital um, out there, and it was losing money. And uh, because of the public financing, they were unable to get a deal with a private hospital system, and so it became available for the University of Michigan. There were several interesting situations that related to that purchase. Uh, the first was you had a bond, and you secured the bond by using um, general revenue from the university. And you, and you, in the public notice for the public hearing, which you never have, you talked about it was secured by tuition, by athletic department money, by all of those kind of things. So when I had my public comment, I said, I think this is a bad practice to tie health system money to general fund money because it's financially risky because of the size of those institutions. So you went ahead, they had a public hearing I had to show the finance department people how to have a public hearing and how to set it up. And I actually had to request my comments to see what the finance people wrote down about my comments at that, in that over at a small conference room at the union. Moving forward, as I've been following this, it was still losing money. It's getting harder and harder to find out how much money it had been losing. And I will tell you about the 340 pharmacy program, and I saw that in the Ann Arbor Observer. Independently of the merits of the program, it was amazing to me to see that if there's a huge major problem with the 340 pharmacy program, the health system is going to have major, major financial problems. That is troubling. Go back, loop back to what I first said about tying it to the general thing. Thank you very much for your time and attention, as always. And I had accessible, accessibility issues that I want to talk to somebody about uh, at a future meeting. I, I, there were, I didn't have access to an elevator. So, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. We really appreciate your feedback and your comments. Uh, we are going to continue to review our public speaker policy as we are... Start hoping to stay focused on, um, you know, having speakers represent different issues without as much duplication. So thank you again for being here today. Over to EVP Rungi uh, to introduce. Thank you, President Ono. Uh, today I have the pleasure of uh, introducing a really important program, which is actually uh, one of the best parts of my job. My job which is our therapy dog program. Uh, Lindsay Herring, the Administrator Director for Child and Family Life, and Chaplain L.J. Brazier will be discussing our Pause for Patients program. They will be followed by Lana Berry, the Coordinator for the uh, Therapause Michigan Medicine program, who will describe the volunteer activities. Chaplain Brazier and Lana are joined by their dogs, Anna and Penny. that better? Okay, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Herring. I am the Director of Child and Family Life. Within Child and Family Life, we have our Child Life Specialist team, uh, Child Life Assistants that help with our activity rooms and special events. We have music therapy, art therapy, a hospital school program, and our Pause for Patients facility dog program, which we're excited for the opportunity and invitation to share with all of you today. 
So for over a hundred years, uh, the University of Michigan has used some form of animal therapy in all of our pediatric care programs. So children at the University Hospital back in Old Maine uh, were visited by calves, piglets, kittens, ducklings. Um, let me forward the slide so you can see some of these pictures. Um, and even a baby elephant uh, that we have a photo of. Since 1987, we've hosted volunteers from Therapaws of Michigan, which you'll have the pleasure of hearing more about as well, an organization that's helped to bring pet therapy dogs um, to visit with our patients and families. And without Therapaws, we wouldn't be here today. They helped to establish the lipschitz danzansky Paws for Patients program. Animal-assisted therapy is known for so many positive effects on our patients of all ages. Animal therapy has a host of benefits for both physical and mental health, such as lowering stress and anxiety, improving blood pressure, increasing patient mobility, and serving as an alternative focus from pain. So uh, due to the increased demand for pet therapy and the availability and acuity um, of care that Therapaws was able to service at the time, Paws for Patients was started in 2016 with the goal that uh, there would be a dog that could be at the hospitals full time to care for our patients and families. Uh, most of our Therapaws volunteers weren't able at the time to go into our high acuity intensive care units. And so our first two uh, Paws for Patients pups were placed in the PICU, the BICU, and the SICU, focused in our intensive care areas. Over the years, uh, the demand for both Paws for Patients and Therapaws has continued to grow and we continue to add more pups. Uh, our hospital dogs are trained through canine assistance, which is based in Georgia, and all of our handlers also go through training through canine assistance bond-based approach, where the relationship and connection with each handler is critically important. Patients from units where we have facility dogs are able to receive these services based on the handler's workflow and clinical coverage of that area. So these are pause for patients pups are with us 40 hours a week. They have full-time jobs and are intended to provide clinical interventions and support the therapeutic treatment goals alongside their handlers who all are clinicians. So I'm briefly going to touch on, on the areas that we are able to service through this program. The first three on the slide are dedicated to Mott Children's Hospital. Barney is allocated to 12 West, which is one of our inpatient general pediatric units, along with our inpatient child and adolescent psych unit. Dashiell is assigned to inpatient hematology oncology and also Sophie's Place, which is our dedicated music therapy recording studio. Fawn is allocated to Pediatric Palliative Care Services, and Anna is with you here today. Anna was one of our originals. Uh, she is dedicated to spiritual care, heavily focused on the adult side, helping with adult palliative care services, the SICU, high-risk OB, and also responds to high acuity needs in MOT. Bugle is allocated to our No One Dies Alone program, Elder Life program, uh, adult emergency services, and social work in the university hospital. And lastly, McCoy is allocated to adult psychiatry services. And in uh, 2021 is when we had um, the ability to be endowed through the Lipschitz Stanzansky family. We are forever grateful for their generosity and support along with all of the other donors for uh, this program. At this time, I'm going to invite LJ Brazier up to share a few patient and family stories and impact of our POTS for Patients program. My friends, thank you for having us. This is such an honor and it's a, a joy to be able to bring some love and comfort to y'all. Appreciate what you do. Um, Anna is my dog, my partner. Uh, she's going to be nine in February. Uh, she was the first of the Pause for Patients dogs. 
uh, we certainly stand on the foundation that Lana and her team built. Um, some of the most extraordinary volunteers in the hospital. Uh, so, you know, they gave us a leg up and um, it's been wonderful. So I'll share two stories. One from uh, my work in peds and one from my work in adult. Um, so my clinical work, uh, I'm a chaplain. Uh, I practice clinical spiritual care and I specialize in taking care of people uh, who are receiving palliative care. Um, and I also specialize in caring for uh, folks who are in high risk obstetrics, uh, which means that they're at high risk for pregnancy loss and often making complex medical decisions related to pregnancy management. Um, so Anna's a perfect fit for that. Uh, she brings comfort, uh, she brings rest, uh, she creates an ability to have instant rapport um, and have much more deep values-based decision-making conversations. Um, so the first story, um, I'm actually gonna talk about the little guy on the left, but the two stories between these two are similar. The guy on the left, this is quite a few years ago now, he um, was in an accident and as you can see, he had uh, pretty significant burns and trauma to all four limbs um, and to his hips, so much so that he couldn't walk for quite a long time. Uh, at the time we had to accommodate him in our adult uh, burn unit. Um, because uh, the burns were so extensive that the PICU couldn't really comfortably uh, care for them as well as they knew our burn nurses could. Um, and being a four-year-old on an adult trauma burn unit is not fun. Um, it's boring, it's scary, there's not the same resources there are in a peds hospital. So after being confined to the bed for quite a long time, um, it was time for him to try to stand. And he was terrified. Um, Anna had been seeing him when he was in the bed and had been getting him to do a little bit of physical therapy. You know, she convinced him to move his arms for the first time because uh, he wouldn't do it for the physical therapist, but when Anna came, she was worth it. Um, and then, uh, so I talked with physical therapy and, and the primary team during rounds in the morning, and we were like, you know, let's try Anna. Um, so the physical therapist picked him up out of the bed and put him on a play mat on the floor. If any of you have been in the children's hospital, you know what those look like. And uh, got down there and then I just let Anna go. And as you can see, I know you can't tell right now, but Anna often, like maybe against the rules sometimes, is often off leash um, in patient rooms because she just is so trustworthy. Um, and so we just let her go. We said, go ahead. She knows this guy, he knows her. So Anna goes over to the play mat and they just play together for a little bit and he starts moving more and more and he starts reaching up to touch her back. And Anna is encouraging him and playing with him. And then before we know it, he's putting his hands on her shoulders and pulling himself up to stand. And so the physical therapist jumped in and encouraged him. And his grandma, who you can see right there, threw his gown on really quick because she wanted a picture. Um, and they just stood like that for a long time. And then uh, after this, Anna starts walking around and he does the same. He keeps holding on to her and starts walking sideways. So he was able to take his first steps in a very long time and able to stand for the first time in large part because we had Anna there uh, to help him feel safe. And while this is a story about a child, um, I want you to know that this is exactly what happens in a lot of my adult patient care as well. All of us, all of us are children, but in much bigger bodies and with a lot more baggage. We have to, as healthcare providers, as humans, as neighbors, we have to recognize that inside every one of us is a child who hurts, a child who's scared, a child who isn't sure if they're safe. And often it's hard to find comfort and safety in the presence of other humans. But dogs, that's different. So that's what Anna does, not only for kids, but for loads of adults. And I hope she can do that for you here too. The other story I'll tell is a little bit more of an adult story. Um, in my adult work in adult palliative care. I have a patient who has a, a rare disorder. If you know anything about medicine, it's called neurofibromatosis type one. So um, if someone has that active disease, it's quite painful. Um, and it doesn't, you, don't, you, can, you can't live very long with it. Um, she's in her mid thirties, has two young children and is married. Um, and she's developed quite a few complications uh, to this point. You know, her life expectancy is months, um, but she recently developed a severe infection, which is gonna shorten her life to weeks. Um, she's understandably devastated and she's stuck in the hospital because of how sick she is, although she would much rather be home with her kids. Um, and on top of this, her dog recently died 
and it was a little tiny lap dog who was small enough that she could comfortably lay with this dog and have it not hurt. So I brought Anna to see her, and um, it was the morning that she was going in for a surgery to try to treat her the source of her infection, and she knew this, that she could also die in the midst of the surgery because of how sick she was. And um, she said, I wish I could just hold a dog one more time. And at this point, we're getting her ready for surgery, anesthesia's there, all these people, but all people Anna has worked with for a long time. And so the anesthesiologist says, well, Anna can get in the bed. We can take her down to pre-op, it's fine. And the patient is like, everything hurts, and I don't know if she can touch me, but like, yeah, can we do that? Absolutely. So told Anna what we needed from her, and she very gently climbed up into the bed and laid next to this woman, and then very gently reached her head over slowly to put her head on the woman's arm, just so gently that it wouldn't hurt her, but they could still touch. And they laid like that for about a half hour while everyone finished getting her ready for surgery, and while she said goodbye to her husband. Uh, so the last thing uh, that she was able to do before she went to sleep, with the help of anesthesia, obviously, um, was her and her husband were both hugging Anna um, and saying their goodbyes. Um, and it's humanizing. And again, it brings that sense of safety in a situation that doesn't otherwise feel safe. Uh, so I want to thank you um, for being the people who said that we could start this program back in 2016, 2017, when we asked you. Um, it has paid off more than I could ever convey. Uh, and I hope we can continue to bring this healing uh, to our whole community. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming here and all that you do to bring uh, comfort, too.